Hi, everybody, and welcome back to uh, today's episode of Fossil Friday Chats. Um, I'm Brittany Stoneberg from the Western Science Center, as always, and with me is Gabriel Santos from the ALF Museum. Good morning, everybody. And today we are joined by a fellow paleontologist and actually one of my classmates at uh, CSUF Fullerton, uh, Tut Tran. Welcome, Tut. Hi, all. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I think uh, I think our viewers are going to be excited to uh, get some dinosaur representation uh, in this uh, Fossil Friday chat. <laughs> I know Gabe and I, Gabe and I are all about the marine and land animals, but now we're talking about Dinosaur National Monument, and I think people will be happy about that. <laughs> I think I, well, I think I was I being petty that... about it because like people were like, "Let's see dinosaurs," and every time someone asked me about dinosaur, I'd be like, "I move it two weeks down." on the schedule <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there eventually like y'all can wait <laughs> yeah so uh welcome tut uh like i said we are both at uh csu fullerton together go titans uh so uh this is gonna be really exciting uh really quick tut's not just a titan he's also my academic brother now because he is in the parm lab woohoo Woohoo! Yeah, so we're all so Gabe is actually a CSUF alumnus, so we're all Titans or former Titans here. Yeah, go Titans! <laughs> what is our? <laughs> this is terrible. What's our um? What do we say again? For like our like? I have no idea. Or, I don't know. Oh, tusks up! No is idea. that what it is? Oh. Oh, that makes sense. Obviously, uh, no. I, mean, I do work for a natural history museum that specializes in. Almost, well, not specializes in, but has lots of proboscidians, so that's appropriate. Obviously, we cared very much about it when we were there, or while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm still getting the hang of it. So my undergrad was UC San Diego, and we were Tritons, and so oh, Tritons and Titans are really awesome. close. And it's like sometimes my brain gets a little bit mixed up. So sometimes, I guess now my mascot for my academic history is like a Neptune version of a mammoth, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah. Now I'm just imagining, I'm now I'm just imagining a mastodon with a, uh, Titan, uh, Triton in its, in its trunk. I'm seeing the, the fish bottom half of the, of the probe. Oh. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting interpretation. Yeah. I don't know how that's going to work. Oh man. Alrighty, so um, I do want to tell everybody a little bit about Tut uh, before we uh, get into his presentation about his work at Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, so since he graduated from, with his bachelor's in science at University of California, San Diego in 2018, he's contributed to several fieldwork, collections management, and fossil preparation projects in Utah and Colorado. After two years of exploring, he's returned to California to study miocene aged sea turtles uh, under James Parham. So uh, Tut, you know, Maybe one day we're going to have to hear about these sea turtles. Because, I mean, dinosaurs are cool, but my seen sea turtles sound especially interesting, too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the nice thing about my project is that there are two different sea turtles that I'll be describing. So there will be a lot to talk about once awesome. all of the data is collected and I start interpreting it. Oh, right. You have to do the science first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I could just bust into the LACM and take those fossils for myself. That'd be so nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> that's a, that's the oh, next Fossil yeah. Friday chat special. It's the uh, Turtle Heist episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You have to have a... Every, every good series has to have a heist episode. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, Tut looks like... Uh, oh, and everybody, as always... If you have questions uh, for Tut after his presentation, we will have a Q&A session and discussion afterwards. So go ahead and put those in the live chat and we'll make sure we ask them of Tut and uh, get some answers to your questions. So Tut, I think whenever you're ready, you are welcome to go ahead. Sure, thank you, Brittany. Today I am presenting Shelf Life, Updating and Preserving Collections at Dinosaur National Monument. So for our outline, Brittany already covered a little bit about me, so we're going to breeze over that. And then we're going to cover a brief history of Dinosaur National Monument. Its abbreviation is DINO, which is the coolest acronym in the National Park Service. 
We're going to talk about how that history informed my internship and the components of my internship and how my internship then fed into what this year's interns did. And we'll finish on an overview of what all has happened and then finish on what is next for Dinosaur. So just a tiny bit about me. I graduated in 2018 and I've been working in paleo ever since and I've started working at CSUF. So for the monument itself, we need to rewind about a little over a century ago. And this was when Utah and Colorado were still a frontier in the United States. And so people like Andrew Carnegie, a very rich philanthropist, were sending people out on expeditions. And one of those people was a paleontologist named Earl Douglas. Now, he was sent out to Utah to find mammals. He was a mammal paleontologist, but he was spending several days trying to find this gold of mammals, and he just couldn't. He was so miserable after a week and a half or so. He was trying to find. He's like, oh, my gosh, I can't find these things. And one day, he stumbles across eight sauropod vertebrae in the Morris information. This was in 1909. This, again, this is very early relative to where we are now. And so these are eight tail vertebrae of probably a patasaurus. These are the long neck dinosaurs. And this is like, oh man, this is excellent. And this location, as, the, as it expanded into a full quarry where they were digging, over time it would just serve as a location where people would come and view. And now it is the spot where people today can go and visit and see the Wall of Bones, the Carnegie Quarry, as it's called. And so over the years, as Douglas and his colleagues were working, they were they decided to designate this as a protected space. They were seeing the value of science and science education that was coming out of it. Because this is a especially special place. And so the quarry was designated as a protected area in 1915, a year before the National Park Service was a thing. And what makes this place really special is that there's a huge concentration and diversity of dinosaurs in the Morrison Formation. These are all of the species that are represented. There's one here that's not in the quarry, and we'll get to that at the end. But we have several sauropods, Barosaurus, Diplodocus, Camarasaurus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, Ornithischians like Stegosaurus, Camptosaurus, Dryosaurus, and our big theropods, which are much rarer, but they are still present in the Carnegie Quarry. The big player, Torvosaurus, which is actually rare, but probably the biggest of the theropods in the Morrison Formation. We have Ceratosaurus, which is quite a bit smaller. It's famous for its horns on its face. And then Allosaurus fragilis is another big player, and it's probably the most famous theropod from the Morrison Formation and in the Carnegie Quarry. And all of these dinosaurs are represented in the entire quarry. So this is a map showing the full extent of what's been uncovered over the course of probably 70 to 80 years of continual digging and preparation work. But if you go to the museum today, this is all that's left. A lot of this rock has been removed and the bones in them was removed and sent out to different museums. Because remember, um, Earl Douglas and his colleagues were coming in from the East Coast. Carnegie was actually situated in Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, which is where this Apatosaurus is and a couple other museums. This Diplodocus is in Denver, and they have a couple of specimens at the Smithsonian. So a lot of these bones, again, were shipped out across the country and even internationally. Despite that, many of the specimens stayed in-house outside of this quarry that is existing today. And that was feasible because Dino had a collection space for a long time. This is what it looked like. And this was established, I think, in the 60s. 
during Mission 66, which was a project taken by the National Parks to renovate their buildings. Uh, the problem arose in 2006, however, because even though the quarry itself is a really hard sandstone, the rock surrounding it and the rock that the museum was built on is all like mud. And the builders during the Mission 66 project didn't foresee the issues of foundational decay that would arise from that. And so the building was condemned and the collection space was destroyed and the exhibit hall is still there. You can still go there and this is the restored exhibit building, but due to a lack of funding, that collection space where all of those specimens were stored was never replaced. And so there was a problem. The park admins had to move the specimens from that collections facility, which was no longer safe for those bones to stay in, and find a new place for them to be. And the solution to that was placing them in two central locations. We have a place called the Fire Cache on the Utah side of the park, and the Canyon Visitor Center, this is the headquarters basement in Colorado, because Dinosaur is actually spanning two different states. Uh, and this is all the space that they could find. Unfortunately, these are not, these were never built with the intention of storing dinosaur bones. And this is evident in the fact that they lack certain amenities that are generally required to have a really good and safe collection space. And those components are a lack of temperature control on the Utah side, there is a lack of rainwater protection, so water would leak through and potentially get onto fossils and destroy them over time. And then on the Colorado side, in the basement, unfortunately, there, there was a serious problem with rodent infestation and the disease that comes with them called hantavirus. And I'll talk about that later. But all of these components, the lack of temperature control, the lack of rainwater protection, and rodent infestation, they all contribute to an increased risk of decay and destruction to these fossils, which are our nat national heritage. So we have to do what we can and what we must to protect them. So this is our problem. As of 2019, these collection spaces, which aren't really collection spaces, is where these fossils were stored and they're unsuitable for ensuring the longevity of those fossils. So the solution that Rebecca Hunt Foster, the park paleontologist, as of 2018, what she was cooking up in her mind was that we could take these fossils from these spaces and temporarily put them somewhere else. Thankfully, there is a somewhere else rather close to the monument. And this is the Utah Fieldhouse of Natural History State Park Museum in Vernal, which is a lot of words. So for the rest of the presentation, I'll be referring it to as either the Utah Fieldhouse or just the Fieldhouse Museum. So this is the backdrop through which my internship was starting. And so the entire purpose of my internship is to prepare the fossils and the information that goes with them for the move to the Fieldhouse from Dinosaur National Monument. And there are a few components with this. The first was to organize and to inventory all of the specimens. The second was to stabilize all of the fossils in jackets or some other containment device. And the last part was conducting outreach so that people could see what fossil conservation looks like. So there I am, and these, this is the team of 2019. So there I am on the left. This is Kellen McKnight to my, to my left. There's Rebecca Hunt Foster. She's still the park paleontologist at Dino. And Julia Anderson was our third intern. So the first component of my internship was organizing and inventorying the collections. And this entailed doing a digital catalog of all of the items. So we had paleontology specimens, so all of our fossils. We had archaeological specimens like arrowheads, 
And we also had plant collections, which the plant collections weren't going to be moved, but this digital catalog was important for keeping track of everything. And it ended up being over 45,000 items contained within the monument. The other component was doing a physical inventory so that when people were eventually going to move these items, they, we, they could keep track of which specimens were grouped together. So we had a physical piece of paper with a list of all of the specimens contained on a shelf or on a drawer, and all of those would stay together once the move started. The next phase is fossil stabilization. And so, unfortunately, a lot of the specimens that we were encountering were in this condition of being stored on trays, which is good, trays with foam. However, there's not enough padding to stop the fossil from moving. And so whenever you, you as a researcher, if you're a visiting researcher and you're opening a drawer, these bones would wobble around because there's no padding to stop them from doing that. And over time, you're going to make them more susceptible to breakage. And so the, our approach to addressing this issue was creating cradles for the small specimens. The bigger specimens had to be decontaminated from Hanta virus. And once they were decontaminated, we could make plaster jackets in order to support those bones. So our foam cradles are really straightforward. This is a metacarpal, a hand bone, from a Cretaceous sauropod, actually. Um, and so the approach is to take a block of foam, whatever size you need, and to carve it in the shape of a bone. And it needs to be deep enough to allow the surface of the bone to be flush with the top of your block. So that's what I've done here with this bone. And the next thing is to line the inside of that cavity with Tyvek paper so that the foam is not chafing the surface of the bone. You don't want that friction there or else whatever detail and information that the bone has is lost. So we spent many days actually over the course of the entire summer doing this process, making these foam blocks and foam beds for several, several fossils. And it was a fun time. Now with our big bones, unfortunately, they were all stored on the Colorado side, or many of them were. And so they were exposed to rodent infestation and therefore hantavirus. So hantavirus is a lethal respiratory infection transmitted via rat feces. And this is an old talk that I've cannibalized from last year. And when I was reviewing this, this is in the age of a pandemic, this is all landing a little bit different because now this is more ubiquitous and more familiar to all of you. Unfortunately, the rats would leave droppings on shelves and on bones. So not only are the bones infected, but it entails that it's not safe for people to work here. And so our job was to protect both current and future workers by disinfecting those surfaces and disinfecting the fossils. And our approach was to wear proper personal protective equipment, use cleaning solution, and we would sun bleach the fossils. So our gear would, would, uh, was comprised of Tyvek suits, nitrile gloves, and a respirator. And now in the age of coronavirus, this all just, when I put this slide in you, last year, it was like, oh, it's so funny because I look like a goofball, but now it's, oof. <laughs> We could say we were prepared like well before the pandemic. But with the bones, we would take them and sun bleach them because you can't put cleaning solution on them because that could potentially damage the bones. And it turns out that UV rays over the course of about four hours were sufficient to kill any of the virus that was on them. So once this process was complete of sun bleaching, we could actually take them and build our plaster jackets. And that requires a few steps. The first is to place the fossil. This is a dorsal vertebra, so a lower backbone of a sauropod, one of our big long neck dinosaurs. We put that bone into a sandbox so that it's nice and cushioned and supported. We place a plastic layer of protection over that so that 
whatever plaster is being flung around isn't binding to the bone. It's protecting it. Then we put our cushion layer on. So this is our this is what's in contact with the bone once the jacket is done. And it needs to conform to the shape of the bone so it's nice and snug. Once that's done, we take fiberglass, soak it in plaster, and then lay it over our cushion layer. And we smooth it out so that once the plaster is set, there aren't any cutting surfaces on there. Because when plaster hardens and it's pointy, it can slice people's fingers open. It's pretty unfortunate. But once this is done and the plaster has set, you flip the whole thing over and you have a finished cradle where the bone is in a nice little home for itself. And you can carry it around without any, without as much concern for dropping it and destroying the specimen. So this is our fossil conservation methodology. We would build cradles for the small things. We would build jackets for the big things. And the other big component of our internship was outreach. And we did two main things for this. Our first was dino demo. So we did this every week, two days a week. We would build cradles and jackets for park visitors to see at the visitor center. And we saw about 200 to 400 people per day. So on a really busy weekend, we would see upwards of 800, 900, sometimes even 1,000 people. And this gave the public not only an opportunity to see what we were doing, but to ask questions and to learn more and to cultivate a sense of environmental stewardship. So this is us doing our thing. It was a lot of fun. It was also very exhausting because it was hot outside. We would do this for eight to 10 hours per session. So this was, this was really good though. This was very rewarding. The other major outreach component was conducting a Girl Scouts event for two days. And this was in collaboration with the field house, actually. We took them to the field house to do several activities, including measuring the cast of Diplodocus that they have in the main lobby. And this was also instilling a sense of environmental stewardship and curiosity for science, similar to what we were doing with Dino Demo, but this was much more intensive and focused because these girls were, we were giving these girls so many activities. And that was pretty much all of the major highlights for my internship. And by the end, we had completed both the digital and physical inventories. Many of the fossils had been disinfected and were given jackets, but there were so many specimens that we just didn't get to in the time that we were there. Our outreach, we made contact with over 3,000 visitors over the course of 10 weeks or 12 weeks, so that was really good. And despite all of this progress of completing the digital inventory, which is actually a huge hurdle, and starting the jacketing process for many of our fossils, there was still a lot of work to be done. And by the time that Julia, Kellen, and I had to leave, the move to the field house was actually still up in the air. And so we left like, what's gonna happen? But thankfully, 2020 came along, and even though a lot of this year has been really rough, we the new interns just pulled through. So our new interns at Dinosaur National Monument are Rudy on the left, Rowan in the middle, and Colton on the right. And thanks to them and Rebecca's efforts, they were able to see the transition to the field house to fruition. So they unpacked all of the fossils in the fire cache on the Utah side and the basement in the Colorado side. So here they are moving a cabinet. This is what the fire cache looks like now and the basement in the Colorado headquarters looks like. Remember, these were super crowded with specimens and now they're just empty. And they've been moved to the field house where they are, it's just, it's so beautiful because it's temperature controlled there's no concern for leakage or, or leakage and environmental hazards. All of these cabinets and these shelves have been designated for the Dinosaur National Monument. 
collections, thanks to the efforts of our new interns, also the collaboration of the Fieldhouse and its staff. This is amazing. This is a huge feat and accomplishment. So in an overview, my internship, while there is still a lot of work to be done afterward, we laid the foundation for ongoing fossil conservation at the monument. We got a lot of things out of the way so that the 2020 interns could take what we did and go further. And they saw that field house transition to fruition. They made it a success. And this whole initiative was vital because the field house has an excellent collections facility that Dinosaur Monument just doesn't at the moment. And this transition, this shipping project, ensures the longevity of those fossils that have been in public trust. And now a really big takeaway of this talk is that fossil conservation of public fossils, of fossils on public land, is the same as preserving our national heritage. All of the fossils that are found on national parks and on public land, they are a part of our history as a country. They belong to all of us, and it is our duty in the National Park Service and in other governmental national re, uh, natural resource management projects to preserve our history for future generations to learn from. Now, all of that said, this is not the end of Dinosaur National Monument story. This is really just the beginning. And so what's next? Eventually, with enough funding, the hope is to have an in-house collections building in the monument, potentially, because the field house has its own things that it has to take care of. I don't think that the fossils at Dinosaur are intended to stay there forever. The other thing is that there is still ongoing science to be done in the monument. The Morris information, the where the quarry is situated, is, has been really well studied, but there are other parts of that unit of geology that are yielding new dinosaurs. And for example, we have Allosaurus geomancini that was published in January. This is a new species of Allosaurus that is actually older than Allosaurus fragilis. So it's sort of a precursor. I think of it as Allosaurus maybe 1.5 versus Allosaurus fragilis being Allosaurus 1.7 or so. And the other thing, elsewhere in Utah, in the same age as G Allosaurus gymansoni, I was on a team that found a humerus, an upper arm bone of Brachiosaurus. And for context, the saltwash member of the Morrison has not been known to produce very many fossils. It's very hard to find them. But the fact that we're finding these specimens means that it may be worth a second look. There's still a lot to explore in the monument. There's still so much science to be done. And with that, I want to thank the people at Dinosaur National Monument. I want to thank Rebecca Hunt Foster because without her, none of the contents of this talk would exist. Julia Anderson and Kellen McKnight, it was a treat to work with y'all. Uh, the the field house, of course, I want to thank, and I want to thank the internship organizers who helped fund my work here, Mosaics and Science and the Greening Youth Foundation. And of course, I want to thank Gabe and Brittany and the ALF Museum and the Western Science Center, respectively, for having me here today. So that is my talk. Thank you all. Awesome. And thank you, Pat. all right yeah thank you that was so cool yeah and um what i really liked about your talk Tut, is i think it really emphasizes as um you know we gabe and i both work for smaller museum collections based museums as well and i think your talk really emphasizes the importance of how museums preserve our natural history our shared natural heritage 
Yeah, it's it's really important to me, and I've been very fortunate to learn that by doing it. Like for me, as a collections manager, uh, watching the things that you're doing right now, it was really it was really cool to see like the amount of work that's going in to preserve these amazing collections. Um, and also, like you get to work with uh, Rebecca Hunt Foster, which is so cool because like. She is a huge, like, inspiration and hero of mine in the world of paleontology. And, you know, if, she, if you're watching, like, I want you to know, like, how amazing it is to have, like, Rebecca in the field. What was it like working with her? Rebecca is amazing. And she has so much experience and wisdom about the science and about just doing paleontology. And she's just such a good person, too. She's been an amazing mentor, like, during my time there and ever since as well. All righty. So our first question um, is from Nathan Newell, who asks, did you find anything weird or unexpected when you were moving and catalog cataloging? Wow, I apparently cannot say that word. Cataloging all those specimens. Oh, man. Uh, there were so many that I have to dig deep a little bit. I'm going to go back. Let's see if my presentation can keep up with my button pressing. But one of my favorite <laughs> specimens was actually one that I showed. And it is the maxilla of an Allosaurus. Come on. Uh, and what was cool about this specimen was not necessarily that it belonged to Allosaurus, but because of the treatment that it had received in the past. So there, whoever found it and decided to put it on exhibit used a permanent epoxy putty to attach a metal rod to it so that it could be mounted for display. And the maxilla no. is beautiful. Uh, and it's a little bit sad that that's how it shook out. Come on, we're almost there. There it is. So this is so this is what the what's pointing upward in this picture is the inside of the mouth of this Allosaurus. Uh, and so they stuck the rod on here so that it would connect to an aperture, an armature, and float. And this is so in hindsight, it's so sketchy because what if that putty were to break, that whole slab of bone would just fall off. But the teeth that are preserved are beautiful. The bone is beautiful. Like this was one of my most favorite and one of the weirdest things that was in the collection for sure. I I wonder if you were I wonder if you were uh, Gabe and I simultaneous cringe as oh, soon yeah. as you mentioned the rod. <laughs> What's funny is like. I can't see y'all. Like, it's the presentation is dominating my screen. Uh -huh. Okay, really quick. So, collections manager time. For those watching <laughs> at home, when, like, back in the day, that was cool, right? Like, you wanted to present your fossils, and people were just finding any way to put them up, and, you know, whatever materials they had to glue things and keep them together, that was what they could do. So, it's not like, I'm blaming anybody or like our current way of doing things in museums. We're not blaming people how they did in the past. They just had to do, but now we know better. So today we look at that and we cringe because we talk a lot about like archival methods in paleontology or in museums in general, because whatever we do to preserve fossils, it has to be reversible too, because any damage we do to the fossil, whether it's like, drilling something in or like putting a type of glue or epoxy that you can't remove that damages the fossil and that could change like the important data that we can get off of it so you know if you're if you're a collector you know at home and you like you want to take care of your fossils there are a lot of cool resources out there for how to take care of fossils in an archival way and not having to you know jam a metal rod down a dinosaur jaw Ugh. Uh, okay, rant over. <laughs> good you, rant, though. You, like, good, it was a good collection ranger rant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is a good rant to have. Yeah, don't apologize for your rant. <laughs> so, when you saw that, 
yeah. when you saw that and pulled it out of the collection did you like feel it in your heart oh yeah like, how how bad that was 1000 uh, percent. like i've i have since used putty like for restoration purposes but never like this <laughs> you're right all i can imagine is it breaking yeah i can yeah, see it i can see it in my mind's eye it's a it's oh a, yeah yeah it's hefty oh man oh okay next question which hopefully which was a good question but hopefully won't be as heartbreaking for the museum professionals in the room um uh this is from cam uh any pathologies you noticed in any specimens you were moving oh uh we had a few i think there was one juvenile maybe diplodocus bone i don't know if it was which of the limb bones it was but it was definitely a limb bone and it was showing some kind of osteoporosis like the bone was way more porous and it had more holes than a healthy animal would have had so i'm remembering that and i wish i had a picture of it but i don't oh uh here's another good question um from science gal 72 how many bones were water damaged and what did you do to help restore them? I think that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't know if we saw any direct evidence of water damage. It was just the fact that the leaks existed that was a cause for concern. And thankfully there were, there were some measures that were preventing the water damage at least a little bit. Like we had plastic tarps over the big things Many of the small things were contained in cabinets, but it was that in combination with the lack of temperature control, because when you don't have temperature control, your fossils, like anything that is exposed to heat and cold and that difference over the course of days, um, which is not a lot of time, your material is going to expand and contract. And because bones are solid like rock, that creates fractures in them. So although the leakage of water was a concern and it was a present problem, it was that and the temperature fluctuation together that made it especially unsuitable for these fossils. That's... that's that brings back memories really like kind of bad memories i guess because when i first started working at the alf museum we uh we had plastic tarps over all of our collection cabinets because we are in the base our collections is in the basement of the museum and unfortunately we've got tons of pipes that run all along the top of the museum so and we've experienced flooding because we're in the basement in california you know we get sometimes we get rainwater and because we're we don't have great drainage it just comes right in so you know like i i don't think a lot of people realize that when we take fossils and put them into museums we actually have to do a lot of work to make sure that you know the rooms and stuff that they're in are really um archival for them we don't just put fossils on a shelf and leave them yeah you know to sit yeah, it's we, not... temperature control and all that's so important yeah, I think there's a misconception that a lot of people think of it as like a, a static storage facility, which it is a storage facility in some way, but there's con constant maintenance that has to go into maintaining a suitable environment for these bones. You can't just shove them in a box and leave them. Yeah, or 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 insects too. Like um, there's a there's this cool story I remember hearing from when I was at the Cooper Center. Um, they had uh, these little uh, so most fossils in a collection have uh, paper tags on them where you'll put all the information on there. Um, usually it's printed. It tells where the specimen came from. It's got its specimen number. Um, but sometimes insects, if they get into collections, they like to eat paper, but they won't eat ink. So insects will eat all the paper and eat around the, the, the ink and just leave the letters behind. So like you'll open a cabinet infested with insects and all you'll see are just like this word soup jumble of like <laughs> printed letters or handwritten letters. And it's like, that's hilarious, but also, damn it, that information's <laughs> gone. Yeah, we didn't run into that problem, but the that brings to mind the importance of having 
a uniform system across your entire collections. And that was an issue that we ran into, not so much with the dinosaurs, but the archaeological collections. Um, they had all sorts of different numbering systems that conflicted with each other, and they didn't have, most of the time, they didn't have, like, actual specimen tags. Like, you can see the specimen tag for this Allosaurus here, and there's a number painted on as well. And there's a lot of information stored on the specimen tags, like, not only what is this specimen and what number it is, but also who found it, the date that it was cataloged, where it was found. And a lot of these archeological co collections, unfortunately, whoever had been keeping track of them before just wasn't doing it in a way that would help people in the future, which is part of our job as people in collections management is when we're gone and when we're out of this job, the people who replace us need to be able to know what's going on. Absolutely. Okay. Here's a question from Alton. Uh, so is there still hope for an eventual on-site collections facility at Dino? That I love is... that that acro I love that the acronym is Dino, sorry. I love that. <laughs> like there's, there, you know, there's a lot of the others. Uh, I mean, the only other one that comes to mind is PIFO, which is Petrified Forest National Park, which is, it's pretty good because it's easy to remember. But Dino yeah. is hands down the best acronym. Uh, yep. But yeah, that's such a big money question and I don't know especially now that we're in a pandemic that does not see a foreseeable end right now like I don't know I don't know how that's going to shake out <sighs> here's a good question from uh, Alexa who's 8 years old did you ever find a shell fossil in the collection uh, yes actually there were a lot of invertebrate specimens a lot of these shells like clams and also clams are in the quarry wall itself a lot of these are freshwater clams so they're occurring in lakes and rivers and they're actually good evidence for how that wall of dinosaurs formed so if you want i can go on that tangent <laughs> yeah go for it okay so a lot of a lot of the time when we were doing our outreach stuff, we had this question of how did this wall become what it is? Why are all these dinosaurs here? And a lot of the time when you have dinosaur bones collected in one spot, the assumption is that maybe they're all, they all died at the same time. And this is evidence of a single, single death event. But that's not really what's happening here. If you were to, this wall is vertical, but if you were to lay it down on the ground, so to speak, you would see that it's stacked in layers. And the fact that the bones are stacking on top of each other and aren't on the same level shows that these are different events where the bones are being collected here. So this is a hard sandstone, and all the bones are jumbled up. Some of the dinosaurs are together fairly well, which probably means they didn't get transported very far in this river. But I think if I'm remembering right, and this is kind of where the freshwater clams come in, because the way that they're preserved, if clam shells are together, if both halves are together, then they were buried when they were still alive. But if the halves are flayed apart, if you only get one shell and not the two together, then your clams are already dead and they've been transported by a storm. In this case, this we think this is a storm. So if I'm remembering right, the, the clams being dead, the way that this is interpreted is that this was multiple storm events that were transporting dinosaurs that had died on the edges of the river that this was existing on. They would die and their corpses would get pushed by these immense floods and they would dam at this spot. So you know how beavers build dams and they cram a bunch of logs into a spot? 
this is kind of what was happening at Dinosaur National Monument in this quarry. And the clams that were already dead and were getting killed by this flood event were also getting transported. So all of this information together informs the way that we understand what's happening here. That's, I look, you know, I'm going to go see that dinosaur wall soon, if, if it's allowed. Uh, I have never seen too. it. It's like yeah, one of I've my biggest like things. You haven't either, Brittany? No, I haven't. I haven't been to. I've actually, which is weird for somebody working in uh, museums and paleontology, but I've never been to Utah. All right, when it's safe, let's go. We'll do a whole okay, trip there. Road trip. Road trip. Rebe Rebe <laughs> Rebecca, if you're watching, we're going to come visit one day. We're going to come say hi. <laughs> to, for you, was that your first time seeing the wall when you went and did your internship? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what was uh, it? In person, I mean, at least. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, like, I actually, that Brachiosaurus discovery that I mentioned at the end, we I was on a trip with Matt Waddle. He's actually in this photo here. Um, yes, Matt. But, yeah, we had actually, we were doing, like, a museum tour of Utah and Colorado because Matt had some specimens that he had to return, and he was also visiting museums to take measurements. And Dino was one of our stops. And this was in May. So this was like a month before my internship started. But that was the first time I saw the wall. And I got to climb a, a little bit on there because Matt was taking some measurements of some of the bones, I think, in this area. But I was just like, That's so cool. Oh, oh, this is so <laughs> neat. And like one of our jobs, too, was to make sure that like while we were doing the digital inventory, even though those bones weren't going to be transported anywhere, we had to make sure that the labels on them were still, they hadn't faded. We had to make sure all of the bones were in good condition and weren't crumbling off. Uh, and so part of that was to actually climb up there and take a close look at how they're doing, which was amazing and also kind of scary because the incline of that wall, maybe it's not super clear from the photos but it's pretty steep it is quite my, steep <laughs> my inner not daredevil i'd say but just like my inner my inner child would want to climb that so bad oh yeah normally i'll see something i'm like i want to climb that it, like i remember my mom would yell at me for like trying to climb rocks when i was a kid so <laughs> i would definitely try try to climb the wall yeah yeah this is i have I had my internship with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science like two weeks after this Dinosaur National Monument internship ended. And that was six weeks of working in Grand Staircase Escalante, and I loved it. But there was one week in the middle that nearly broke me because we were in like Slot Canyon. I don't really know how to describe it. It was so intense. The hike that day was so brutal and it was partly because the inclines there are just so steep like comparable oh. to this but like, like at least here if you hit the ground you hit the ground fairly soon after you fall off but <laughs> there was like where's the floor <laughs> oh my goodness oh uh, yeah i mean I, both of these like I, I'm not the best with heights, so both this experience and that one were just like, oh boy. And here, like, because it's an exhibit, if you're climbing on the wall, people are going to shout at you and be like, what are you doing up there? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to work. <laughs> not like yeah, nothing alone, like. But I, I'm like, I don't, I need to watch my footing or else I'm going to fall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be like that's like outreach on hard mode. Nothing like having to answer visitor questions while also trying not to fall. Yeah, just like, and I like at the time I didn't understand that like having actually, and it depends on where you're climbing. But when you are climbing on a steep incline, like you need to be upright so that your your center of gravity is centered where your feet are. But I didn't understand that. So this photo maybe illustrates it a little bit, but I was like Spider-Man crawling, Spider-Man crawling all over the wall to keep my center of gravity really close to it, which is not good. <laughs> I would fall. I would, you know, I, I know I'm going to fall. 
I just know it. Like I'm, I my center of mind. gravity is. No, oh, go ahead, Brittany. Oh no, I was just gonna say it's like I know I would fall, but I would be concerned about falling and breaking a fossil. I wouldn't care about breaking myself. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'd be so terrified in the moment. I would be very terrified of not hurting my own person, but hurting the fossils, and then I'd worry later about myself. <laughs> You're like you're like my you're like our volunteers. I have to give a special like uh, like talk to them about safety, and I'm like, yeah, no fossil is worth your life. Yeah, if a fossil <laughs> breaks, true. if there's an if there's an earthquake, the don't fossil. save the fossil, save yourself. Yeah, every yes, yeah, you could fix the fossil. Yeah, every like, just so those of you in the audience know, anytime you start volunteering or anytime you start a job in paleontology. Chances are you will get that talk, and you may get that talk multiple times over the course of your early career. Yep, and everybody, pretty much everybody, breaks something at some point. Yeah, this, that's that's the old saying, right? Yeah, you're not a paleontologist until you break a fossil. <laughs> yeah, this was still the stage at which I was like, oh no, I'll break something. Oh geez, and I did break a few things, and it sucked. But then once I worked for the Denver Museum and then for Treebold Paleontology earlier this year, where prep and field stuff is a really heavy component, whereas this was collections management, then I got like kind of numb to breaking stuff. I was just like, oh, I broke it again. I guess I'll get the glue. But <laughs> you get used to it. It's yeah. Breaking a fossil is not the end of the world. It still sucks a little bit. But, but it happens. You form a callus toward it. <laughs> <laughs> and for our audience, we're not trying. It just happens because fossils are delicate. Yeah. Exactly. Alrighty. Here, I think, is a great question to end on. Uh, what? Uh, this is from Bailey. What was your favorite dinosaur specimen you worked with? Oh. At the monument. Hmm. I think it was that Allosaurus yeah. maxilla that I was it's talking about with the rod. Because it has such, it there's such a story to it. Every bone has stories to them. Like you can learn about their bio, like the animal's biology, where it lived, how it lived. But there's such a human component to that Allosaurus specimen. If I can go back to it, so you can see it. Just. And that what part of what what part of what interests me about paleontology is not just the dinosaur science, which I love, and that's hopefully what's going to keep me employed, partly. But the other side is all of the people who are currently in and have been in paleontology over the course of this science's history. That side to me is fascinating, and learning about who they are, what they're like, and remembering that they're human, like. These are all people with their own passions and personalities working on these things and seeing where that peeks through in their research and the fossils that they work on and the people that they impact through their work is fascinating to me. So true. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Ted. I think this is really a, a very interesting peek and in, not only into your work, but the Dinosaur National Monument. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So I guess that does it for this episode. Thank you very much, Tut. Um, next week, we actually won't have a Fossil Friday episode on Friday because next week is National Fossil Day. And that means we are going to have a very special event on Wednesday, October 14th. That's our National Fossil Day Let's Tour live stream. So uh, me at the West, me at the Alpha Museum and the Western Science Center folks, we're going to be visiting museums virtually across the United States, visiting their collections and talking with the paleontologists who take care of them to learn about the importance of collections. So make sure you tune in on Wednesday starting at 8 a.m. Pacific time, and we're going to be visiting all these really great museums to see what they've got inside. And as usual, if you want to support this program and programs like it at the Alpha Museum and the Western Science Center, you can find links on how to donate to our museum in the description below. Thank you all so much, and we will see you next week. Yep. Bye. Thank you all. See you next week. Thank you, everyone.